Okay, good. Hi guys, uh, I am uh, now uh, speaking to you through a microphone uh, and I'm gonna continue wearing my hat. And my camera's doing something funny, isn't it? It's like auto adjusting. I didn't notice that before. Hat. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of questions, so I'm just gonna uh, tackle what I can. Um, question about shelter. Uh, can you discuss the dual nature of the brush obscuring the babies, both from predators and from the player? With the owl, I was not always confident that there were still five babies. So this is an interesting difference between uh, a player and an observer. We've encountered a lot of situations where uh, because there were um, there was so much going on on the screen in a game like Half-Life uh, or uh, oh God, I don't know what the best example is. It, there have definitely been times when everybody in the chat has seen the thing that I was supposed to see and do uh, and I just don't see it. Um, and I don't see it because I'm playing the game and I'm focused on some other like part of the screen uh, visually or I'm focused on some other element of the game uh, uh, in terms of like mechanics or performance and and so my attention just isn't wide enough to see the thing that I was supposed to see that everybody else saw because um, they weren't actually playing at the time. I think this is kind of a, a little bit of the opposite effect where um, because I have control like of the movement of the badger uh, and because I have control of the camera I have a much better sense of where everything is when it's all hidden than the chat does than like you watching the game uh, just watching um, there's a little bit more ambiguity there and so for me I was pretty confident that I had all of the babies I, I was pretty confident that I was watching just enough in the moments when I felt like I might have lost one um, to be sure that I hadn't lost one. But I think that has a lot to do with like me, I was using the camera to verify for myself uh, the information that I already expected to be true. Whereas if you're just watching the stream or you're watching the, the video, then you don't have as much contextual information. And so the camera, you know, might not be in the place where you want it for long enough to, to get all of that information. It's really interesting how like that can flip, how that effect can change pretty dramatically depending on, um, how the game is set up, uh, you know, who feels like they're able to process more information. Um, another question about shelter. What did the game do? Yeah, am I like really popping in and out in a funny way? Sorry about that. Do I always do that? Have I just never noticed before? What did the game do to get you so invested in keeping all your cubs well cared for? Is it just the plaintive feedback when you lose them or was starting with a dead looking cub part of the key? So here's what I think the dead looking cub was actually doing. Um, even though I, so my initial sort of thought was that it introduced concepts of mortality into the game very, very early. And I think it does do that. It suggests that the cubs are delicate um, that they need to be cared for. They won't just take care of themselves. Uh, but it's also the very first thing that you do in the game, the first action that you have that has an effect that gives you any kind of positive feedback um, is feeding that cub, feeding that little badger. Uh, and um, there's an effect where when you engage in an action, this is I mean, this is, I don't, I don't want to like get too pseudoscience in how um, uh, like neurons work uh, because I don't think the analogy quite actually would satisfy a, a neuroscientist. Um, but there's something to when you take an action, um, that action becomes a little bit naturalized and taking that action again 
uh, is easier to do and feels better and feels more natural. Uh, and certainly, and this is something that we use in games all the time, when you're rewarded for an action, then that action feels good. Uh, and you seek out more opportunities to perform that action. So the very first thing that the game does is it has me feed a cub. It has me care for a cub. And now not only have I gotten into a mental framework, a mental like contextual space where um, feeding the cubs is something that I do, uh, but I've also been rewarded for that behavior, and so I'm going to naturally seek out that behavior more. And this isn't just like, I'm going to look for more opportunities to feed the cubs because I get that good sound effect when I do. Um, it's also, it builds a little bit of a narrative emotional connection between me and the cub. And because I have, this is, this is like the same principle where um, if you're a creepy salesman, uh, and you, uh, you approach somebody that you're trying to sell something and you ask them a yes or no question to which they will say yes. And then you ask them to buy the thing that you want to sell them. Um, they're more likely to say yes to your second question if they said yes to your first question. So if you go up to somebody and say like, isn't it a nice day? Do you want to buy this car? Um, they'll naturally say yes to the first question and then they're more likely to say yes to the second question. Um, obviously there's a lot of factors to go into uh, making a purchasing decision and so it's not a guarantee but it, it there is a psychological effect like we have this thing where when we say yes we're more likely to say yes again. Um, I think when we when we take an action, we're more likely to take that action again. Uh, so when we like th when we we nurture a virtual character, it, when that's the first thing that the game has us do, then we're more likely to nurture that character again. I think that's like an important part of how it sets up that dynamic. Um, okay. Apartment questions. Here's here's a couple apartment questions. Uh, how do you feel about the theme of using art specifically to process life events? Um, guy, I don't know. I'm I I like it. I think it's good. It hits me very close to home. Uh, I actually like before the show. I went out for a walk uh, and I was just walking around my neighborhood thinking about relationships because I knew this was going to be like play by play relationship edition. Um, and I, I, this is part of how I deal with, uh, with things though. I, I like to make stuff. Um, I feel very, very sympathetic to, to Nick in that the way that I process things a lot of the time is to try to make things out of them. Um, and I'm not a visual artist. I'm certainly not a cartoonist, but uh, I do feel like there's a, there's, there's, I can understand where that comes from. So I don't know that that's universal. I, I think that other people have different ways of processing things. Um, but I do also think that like we all we all have ways that we prefer to process things and, and ways that we like methods that we've developed to process things. Um, but I think we also kind of we can all like we understand how processing things works and so we all kind of get a sense of how other people process things as well and so even if maybe like using art to process life events is not something that you specifically do i think there's probably something to that action that feels that you can relate to that that everybody can relate to um, maybe not like directly specifically, but everybody can sort of understand how that works. That's my thought. It's hard for me to say because I, I think I do relate to it much more directly. 
Um, do you think having to type part of the novel makes you connect with the words more than if you were just expected to read it? I think it does a couple things, and I think that is one of them. Um, although, frankly, I think reading them out loud as they appeared one by one made me connect with the words even more than typing them did. Um, typing them was kind of a mechanical thing of uh, processing individual letters. Uh, whereas because I was doing this for a, for a stream, I was also, I wanted to read uh, the text and the text was only appearing sort of word by word. And so I was reading it word by word and that felt very different than reading it like all in one chunk. Uh, and I, well, I don't know. I don't know that it made me connect with the words more, but it certainly made me think about the words individually as words. Um, more than like processing them as a, a narrative chunk. Um, I think it made me think more about the themes that were implied by the words than, uh, than like the actual story of them in some ways. Um, but the thing that I think happens mechanically is that I'm very interested in this sense of flow. Uh, I'm very interested in this sense of like doing a thing and doing it right and like getting into a headspace where I'm just doing it right. And that actually has very little to do with the words. Uh, it has much more to do with seeing the letters that are coming up and hitting those letters properly and hitting them at a pace that's consistent uh, and accurate. Um, and you, I kind of don't process those words, which is why I think it's important. And I honestly don't remember what the first version of this looked like. I don't remember if like I gave this feedback to, to the developers at one point. Um, I, yeah, I don't know, but I think it's important that there's, there's two parts to that vignette. And one is you're typing in words and the other is words just appear. Like you type in a sentence and then the rest of the paragraph just appears and you can read it. Because then when I stop engaging with the keyboard, uh, when I stop in engaging with those letters directly, then I'm reading more in a, in a more comprehension focused way. And I think that's really important too. Um, here's a question. How important is it that the different vignettes present people of different ages and life phases? Would the story be as effective if it were all about 20 somethings? Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to answer this really simply. I think, yes, the story would be effective if it was all about 20 somethings, but I think it would be about something different. Uh, I think that apartment is trying to be about relationships in a large sense in in sort of a wide scope um and it's not trying to be about a specific phase of life or a, a specific type of relationship um and so it's important for the game where that is its design goal to actually explore a wide range of different relationships. Um, I think that it could not accomplish that goal if it was about all 20 somethings. But I think you could easily make a different game where the goal was to explore maybe in much more depth uh, the kinds of relationships that occur at a specific moment in, in uh, life or um, to explore a type of relationship or the, the relationships that a type of person has, to f narrow that focus in um, and then uh, create a very effective game that does that. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's a lot about what is the design goal. Are you hungry? Do you want turnips? Do I need like to pull out some turnips for you? Should I hunt foxes? I'm just going to cry. Um, which of the vignettes was most effective for you and why? I can't even answer that. I love the typing one. I don't know. I like them all. I really do. Um, I like the typing one because it's got the most uh, mechanical harmony with uh, with this 
this sort of state of mind and feeling that I totally relate to, um, like getting into a zone and trying to overcome writer's block and um, getting interrupted by yourself or by other things and feeling frustration at that. Like I, I really, really super relate to that and I love how mechanically resonant the game is, how, how the interactivity is like really builds that feeling, that, that state of mind. I love the way that the controls in the drip drip depression uh, apartment were um, like reinforced how sad and uh, sluggish that whole like everything about that designed space felt um, like it was really supporting one idea um, and then the last one that we did with the with the, all the different vehicles and the tree, I thought that tree was just unbelievably gorgeous. I liked that a lot. Um, were those two different ones? Was there one with the tree and one with the vehicles? I think they... Oh! No, the tree was the... Oh, fuck. No, they were the... I don't remember. I think they were the same vignette. The tree one was also... I think they were both the, the gravestone one. Whatever. I That was... I thought that was... Uh, um, I thought the tree... If that was a different vignette... I don't remember now. If the tree was a vignette by itself, that was just gorgeous, like, visually uh, and spatially. Walking around it was beautiful. And then the one with the car, all of the different vehicles that ended in the grave, was... I loved the transitions between the different modes of transportation. I loved the way that that story was so simple and the way that it was presented around the environment. Um, and it was, that was kind of a more predictable, I guess, like, uh, like I knew where that was going, but it is also like a universally effective moment I think of uh, that kind of loss to death that that um, understanding of mortality and and the mortality of other people and how painful that is um, so I I don't know I can't answer that question I refuse to answer that question uh, okay all right last question. Oh, I should actually look at the the chat. Um, <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, last question. Uh, I felt the music was general. I think this is about this is about part apartment. Yeah, I felt the music was ge general sad background music. How important do you feel it is to actively use music along with the current visual cues and story situations, or can a consistent, mostly background soundtrack be just as effective? Um, this is not my area of expertise. I think, in general, I would say that uh, the more specifically designed your music is, the more specifically designed any element of your game is the more effective it can be uh, and so if your if your music is designed to fit specifically with this moment in the narrative and specifically with this visual composition of the scene then that has the potential to be more effective than something that is just like generally sad um, but that's not to say that like music that just sets a tone is ineffective. I think an important role of music is to just set the tone, an emotional tone for a scene. Um, apartment kind of has a pretty consistent emotional tone. And so uh, all of the music hits a similar tone. Um, I can't say that I actually... Like, I would have to go back and listen a little bit more carefully for what the music is in each scene. I know that there is different music in each of the vignettes. Um, and my expectation would be that they play a little bit more, like, that music plays into 
the specific feeling of each of those vignettes. Um, because you can you can really narrow the target of the like emotional design goal for each of those vignettes pretty close. One of them is about grief. One of them is about uh, sort of uh, restless frustration. One of them is about um, uh, what's the one that I'm missing? One oh one of them is about depression. Um, I'm not a cat anymore. Uh, so like those goals are very specific and I expect that the music is designed to set those sort of subtly different tones. The music in Nick's apartment is more difficult because there's there's more variety to the narrative in Nick's apartment. Uh, I think that a dynamic soundtrack could has the potential to be more effective because from one moment to another if you're reading something that is like a warm and glowy memory of uh of madison then the the soundtrack could reflect that emotion and then when you uh re like encounter a memory that it's a more uh bitter or um unhappy or or like you know confrontational memory then the music could reflect that and have that be different um i imagine that that's a scoping issue for this game honestly i mean given what i know about the production of the game uh, that involves a much more complicated musical composition uh that is capable of being dynamic in that way uh, and then it involves implementing some complicated logic to actually change the music, to, to um, explicitly sort of track the expected state of the uh, player's experience from second to second, uh, and then change the music based on that. And you'll see that like a lot of AAA games these days do this sort of thing. They'll have music that is composed to be dynamic and so you, they'll have a background track where you can spend as any amount of time exploring an area and then when you change into a different area or you discover something that track will seamlessly change uh into something else uh or it will get something added to it to sort of change what the emotional tone is um, but that's a real complicated thing to do, and it requires like quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of like manpower and expertise to pull it off. And I think it, I, I'm guessing it's just out of scope for this game. So if that's the case, then the best you can do for Nick's apartment is you create a track that that like has the correct general tone. Uh, and um, and don't address the sort of specific variations in it. Uh, or if you have like a large arc so that you know that at some point it's gonna be like uh, real sad and then it's gonna get like angry, um, then you could have different music to sort of shift between those large sections, but um, a lot of the emotional changes of the emotional variation in Nick's apartment is kind of like micro variation. It happens very quickly and it happens out of order and in very specific spots. And so that would be difficult to, to um, set to music to actually score. Um, okay, cool. Thanks, guys. This was a lot of fun. I'm so glad I got to play the apartment demo. Um, the, uh, I'm, yeah, the, um, uh, the developers for Apartment, I think, watched some of that playthrough and, uh, uh, would be maybe interested in, um, having a conversation about the game on the, uh, Undefined Behavior Forum, if anybody wants to, um, go over there and pose questions, I'll make sure that, like, they're connected to that and can can answer stuff uh, or have more of this kind of conversation if you want to talk to the devs themselves um, obviously you can also go to their kickstarter page and uh, ask questions through that interface as well i'm sure they'd be happy to answer there
Um, if you're looking for the forum, it's undefinedbehavior.com slash forum. Uh, so join us over there um, if you have more questions or want to discuss these games with the community. Um, I will see you guys next Wednesday, uh, and we'll do more badgery things, okay? Uh, thanks a lot for joining me, and um, see you next time.